Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ron Vale from Genelia, and I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to Life Science Across the Globe. Uh, well, we've completed eight weeks, and we've circumnavigated the world. We've been to North America, South America, England, Europe, Africa, uh, India, and last week, China. And now we're going to return to where we started um, uh, at Genelia Research Campus. Uh, we've just met as a group of sister institutes, and I think there's been um, uniform high enthusiasm for this series. Uh, we've heard uh, great talks, both in science and science culture. And probably in the future, we're going to make uh, some interesting uh, new additions and ideas to this series that I'll, I will announce later. Um, but uh, today, uh, we're going to return, as I said, to where we started at, at Genelia. And um, what I'd like to do uh, today is to introduce Jean Stevens, who will in turn introduce today's speakers. Uh, many of you already know Janine as the excellent moderator of the Q&A of the talks in this series. Uh, but behind the scenes, Janine is also the organizer of life science across the globe. And she's putting an enormous amount of work into making uh, this series a uh, success. So um, I would now like to tell you a little bit more about Janine. Um, Janine received her PhD in cell and molecular biology from Drexel University College of Medicine. Uh, and then she uh, completed a postdoc in the tumor angiogenesis unit of the National Cancer Institute at the NIH. And right after uh, her postdoc, Janine joined Janelia as uh, the new director of scientific programs where she has taken on a leadership role in building a program of conferences and seminars, which have now become a very successful hallmark of Genelia. Her role includes organizing uh, 25 or more conferences, workshops, and courses each year, and uh, as well as several internal and external seminar series, such as the one uh, uh, Life Science Across the Globe. And she's also been a key contributor in many other programs at, at Genelia, um, including the development and facilitation of several institutional initiatives, including a Genelia mentorship program, uh, also tracking career outcomes of trainees, and the launch of a new HHMI seminar series focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So uh, thank you, Janine, for all the work that you're doing for life science across the globe and really all the many things that you do for Janelia. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll pass things over to Janine who will uh, host today's uh, Life Science Across the Globe. Thank you, Ron, for that very nice introduction. Um, I am very pleased today to be introducing our speakers, both of whom I consider to be great friends and colleagues. So our first speaker is Eric Schreider. <clears throat> Eric received a chemistry degree from Truman State University in Missouri. He did his graduate work in biological chemistry with Catherine Drennan at MIT using x-ray crystallography to study the molecular mechanism of nickel ion homeostasis in bacteria. Eric completed his postdoc with Richard Lee at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston studying metabolic signaling and then he moved on to a faculty appointment at the University of Puerto Rico. There, he worked on the molecular aspects of protein S nitrosylation signaling. Eric joined Genelia in 2011 as a senior scientist with a focus on prototyping new protein-based tools for neurobiology. He then became a group leader at Genelia in 2015. Eric's lab uses protein engineering to develop molecular tools for visualizing the structure and function of the nervous system. And he will tell us about several of those tools in his talk today. All right. Thank you, Janine. Let me share my screen real quick. OK. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Eric Schreider. I'm a group leader at Genelia. And my lab develops molecular tools for biology, some of which I'm going to tell you about today. 
So I'm part of our molecular tools and imaging core research area here at Genelia, and you'll hear more about that from Luke after my talk. Oops. So I'm fascinated by protein molecules like this one, uh, which are quite large molecules that perform a huge range of functions uh, inside our cells and outside our cells. My background is in structural biology, actually, figuring out the three-dimensional structures of these large molecules to learn more about their functions in our bodies. Now, at Genelia, I've tried to use that knowledge to engineer proteins with new or enhanced functions that are useful in some way. We'll get back to this particular protein molecule in just a minute. So since Genelia opened about 15 years ago, the focus has been on discovering how neuronal circuits in brains process information uh, and on development of new imaging technologies to better visualize biology. And much of the molecular engineering work from my lab and others at Genelia has been at the interface of these missions, uh, developing new fluorescent probes that are well suited to new microscopes being developed here at Genelia, and with the purpose of imaging the activity of neurons inside the brains of behaving animals. So I'll tell you today about three different molecular tools uh, that have been developed here at Genelia and how they're being used. So the first of these tools is a fluorescent calcium sensor called GCAMP. And I want to introduce this tool by first showing you uh, what's currently possible using GCAMP. So here we're looking into the brain of a mouse using a two-photon mesoscope that was engineered here at Genelia. And each of these little flashing donut-shaped things is a single neuron. Uh, we can see about 5,000 of these neurons here in this, uh, uh, in this, <coughs> in this movie, which is from the, the middle part of the mouse's brain called the hippocampus. This is new unpublished data from Nelson Spruston's lab. So every time a neuron sends a communication to all the other neurons that it's connected to, called an action potential, calcium rushes into that neuron. And we can see that with an increase in the fluorescence from this GCAMP calcium sensor. So those are all the little flashes that you see. Now it turns out that this mouse is running on a ball, uh, navigating in virtual reality through a tunnel, uh, looking for specific locations to get a reward, as you can see in these videos. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So it's possible with these tools to study how the coordinated activity of many neurons uh, drives these complex behaviors like you see in the video. So this giant molecule that we saw in a model of earlier is actually a structure of the GCAMP calcium sensor protein. Um, it's really hard to understand what's going on when we just look at all of these atoms together like this, uh, but if we color it differently, you can see it's comprised of a calcium sensor protein domain called calmodulin, uh, which is in blue here, which is found actually in every single one of your cells. If we make it transparent, we can see these four orange calcium ions that are bound to calmodulin. And then on the left is the green fluorescent protein that you might have heard of from jellyfish, with its chromophore right in the middle. And that's the part that's responsible for fluorescence, where it absorbs blue light and then gives off green light. These two proteins have been sort of stitched together into a single molecule that can, such that the binding of calcium over here communicates through this interface with the amount of fluorescence light given off by the GFP over here. This is a more traditional way of representing protein structures. This idea to manipulate the fluorescence of GFP by incorporating sensor domains like this was originally the work of Roger Shen, who won the Nobel Prize in 2008 for his work engineering fluorescent proteins. But early prototypes of GCAMP and other sensors like this were really not very useful, actually, for neuroscience, um, either because they weren't very brightly fluorescent or the fluorescence didn't change very much, or maybe they weren't even stable at the body temperature of a mouse in some cases. So optimizing GCAMP function for use in neuroscience at Genelia started with some great protein engineering work uh, by Lin Tian in Lauren Luger's lab, uh, motivated by input from Carl Svoboda, and their success creating GCAMP3 combined with sort of the appetite for the neuroscience community for tools like this drove the expansion of this effort into a team project at Genelia called the Genie Team Project, composed of uh, a core group of scientists here contributions from uh, our shared resources groups at Genelia, and then uh, with input 
uh, and sort of advice from a steering committee of, of group leaders at Genelia. So they have a mission then to optimize molecular tools like GCAMP to the point where they're generally useful for biologists and then to disseminate those tools in the form of ready-to-use reagents and protocols. So we have these high-resolution three-dimensional structures of GCAMP, like these that I determined uh, actually more than 10 years ago now. Uh, and we have measurements of its function in a test tube. But actually, we really still can't model the atomic level dynamic details of exactly how it functions. And that's generally true in the field of protein function. Proteins are just too large and dynamic. What that means is if we want to make improvements to this tool, we really have to be able to test many perturbations in a screen, <clears throat> making changes to individual amino acids throughout the protein, and then testing the effects of those changes. So the Genie team project uh, set up a screen for GCAMP function where they can test thousands of variants per year in neurons because that's ultimately where these sensors need to work well. So this is a movie of the robotic stage on the Genie screening microscope. So there's a 96 well plate containing neurons uh, expressing different GCAMP variants. And then um, an electrode drops into each well, as you can see, sequentially. And it electrically stimulates those neurons in, in that particular well to fire action potentials. While a microscope from below the plate is imaging the fluorescence response of the neurons from the GCAMP variants. So over the years, the sensitivity of GCAMP has improved dramatically, um, plotted here as the response to a single action potential in neurons. And believe it or not, you're actually going to see further improved GCAMP variants uh, that continue this trend very soon from uh, Lauren Luger's lab and the Genie team project. If we map these changes that, um, that have been made over the years onto the structure, most of the changes actually are located at this interface between uh, this calcium binding domain and the fluorescent protein domain, which makes sense because that's how the communication takes place. So Genie then validates these improvements that have been made uh, in vivo in different animal models and then makes them available to the community prior to publication. So AdGene, a not-for-profit repository for DNA plasmids, has distributed GCAMP plasmids and AAVs to thousands of labs at this point, actually. Um, and similarly, transgenic mice and flies and fish expressing GCAMP are also available from other repositories. So here's one more example of GCAMP imaging. This is a larval zebrafish with GCAMP in all of its neurons being imaged on an incredible light sheet microscope called the ISOVIEW that was developed here at Genelia by Philip Keller's lab. So here you can see basically all of the fish's 100,000 neurons in action. Um, these large pulses of activity that you see in the, the back part of the fish's brain, called the hindbrain, um, occur when the fish is swimming, uh, or at least when it thinks it's swimming. Um, this fish has actually been paralyzed so that it stays under the microscope, because fish are actually quite fast, uh, and they're too small to carry the microscope around with them. Um, so labs like Misha Aaron's lab at Genelia have set up a virtual reality system for the fish, kind of like we saw for the mouse earlier, to study certain behaviors. But what if you really need to know what happened in the brain while the fish is actually swimming around? Uh, or what if you need to correlate the activity of these neurons um, with the presence of a specific protein or mRNA molecule in the neurons after the imaging experiment is already over? So with those ideas in mind, uh, we recently engineered a different type of calcium sensor. So instead of reversibly getting brighter and dimmer like GCAMP does, we engineered a fluorescent protein that irreversibly changes color from green to red when calcium is elevated and when we're shining a purple light on it. So we call this molecule Campari, and we say that it's an integrator because the more calcium that's present uh, in the neuron, the more the neuron will change colors from green to red. And it stays that way so that we can read out that signal later. So now uh, we have our fish with Campari in all of its neurons instead of GCAMP, uh, and we shine this purple light on it while it's just swimming around in its dish. And we can actually capture a snapshot of the calcium activity in the fish's brain while that light was on. So the more magenta uh, a neuron appears in the snapshot, the more calcium it had when the light was on. And we can read out this signal on a microscope 
maybe 10 minutes or even an hour later because the color change is irreversible. So this lets us see which neurons or circuits were active at a particular time <clears throat> without having the fish stuck to the microscope. So depending on what the fish is doing or experiencing when the light was on, uh, we see very different patterns of Campari color change throughout the fish's brain. And we're now working on protocols to be able to correlate this permanent activity signal with other downstream analysis like transcriptional profiling of individual neurons. Okay, so I've shown you two calcium sensors uh, so far that let us see brain activity. But if you remember uh, back to your biology courses, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I know that neurons communicate with each other through electrical signals, right? And calcium is involved in a lot of other signaling processes in the cell. And you would be totally right on both accounts. So calcium is really just a convenient proxy for the activity of neurons. And we'd really like to be able to see the electrical or transmembrane voltage signals. So from this simultaneous recording of calcium and voltage in a neuron that I'm showing here on the screen, you can see that there are signals in the voltage uh, that don't show up in the calcium, which are highlighted by these arrows here. You might also notice that the calcium signals seem to be a lot slower than the voltage signals. And that's easier to see if we, if we zoom in on the time axis. So here on the top in orange, I'm showing the response of one of the faster calcium sensors to a, a single action potential that happened here. And by the time the fluorescence goes up and then comes all the way back down, uh, quite a lot can have happened uh, in, with the voltage of a neuron, as you can see from this in vivo recording in blue at the bottom. Um, so imaging voltage turns out to be really hard because these signals are so fast. So um, these spikes like this, these action potentials, last for only a millisecond. So some labs at Genelia are working on engineering new microscopes to be able to image large volumes really fast. And on the fluorescent sensor side, the biggest challenge is getting enough photons of light out to be able to see these signals when you're taking an image every millisecond. So you can crank up the light source on your microscope, uh, but then all of the fluorophores bleach very quickly and then the experiment's over. So to address this problem uh, and get better in vivo voltage imaging, uh, we've been working on a new strategy to replace fluorescent proteins, like GFP here, in voltage indicators with brighter and more photostable small molecule dyes, like this fantastic Genelia fluor dyes that Luke will tell you a little bit more about uh, in, his, in the next talk. And we've been able to retain the genetic targetability by having these dyes bind specifically and irreversibly to a protein domain called the halo tag. And once that dye is bound, then this uh, halo tag dye conjugate functions basically as a fluorescent protein. And we call these chemigenetic indicators because they require a chemically synthesized dye component and this genetically targeted protein. So we made a fluorescent voltage sensor called Voltron uh, by fusing a rhodopsin voltage sensor domain to a halo tag domain so that it can permanently capture these Genelia fluor dyes coupled to halo tag ligands that we can add exogenously to the sample. Then as the membrane potential changes, the fluorescence from the dye either gets brighter or dimmer. And this happens as a result of energy transfer from the dye to the retinal cofactor within the rhodopsin domain. So membrane depolarization uh, results in an increase in the absorbance by the retinal which causes a decrease in the dye emission since more of that energy is getting transferred as FRET. And we showed that Voltron, bound to a variety of different dyes, could sensitively report membrane potential changes in neurons, including following action potentials. This is the work of Ahmed Abdel Fattah, a very talented postdoc in my lab, uh, who's about to start his own lab at Brown University soon. So here I'm showing an image of labeled neurons expressing Voltron along with an electrode recording and an optical recording um, for that neuron for five spectrally distinct dyes. Now the ability to use any of these different color dyes with the same sensor protein lets you really work around other fluorescent labels that you might have in your sample for other reasons. But our main objective here was using these small molecule dyes to get more photons out. So we directly compared the fluorescence brightness of Voltron with uh, existing voltage indicators. We saw that Voltron labeled with JF549 here in red 
It was about 30 fold brighter than ASAP1, which is, uh, uh, uses GFP as the fluorophore, the fluorescent protein we saw earlier. Uh, and it was about three and a half fold brighter than ASAM neon green, um, which uses one of the brightest fluorescent proteins that's been identified to date. And to be sure this difference wasn't uh, just a function of the expression level of these different sensors, we actually measured the brightness of individual molecules of these sensors in the membranes of those same neurons. And Voltron was still about three and a half fold brighter at the level of individual molecules. Now the photostability of Voltron was also better than these sensors when illuminated with the same intensity excitation light. And really the combination of the improved brightness and photostability yields about tenfold more photons from a molecule of Voltron relative to fluorescent protein-based indicators if you compare the integral under these curves. So to demonstrate these advantages for in vivo imaging, we've collaborated with several biology labs here at Genelia to image Voltron in flies, in zebrafish, and in mice. And then I'll, I'll quickly show you examples from each. So in adult fruit flies, Glenn Turner's lab uh, here at Chenelia has imaged Voltron in dopamine neurons. Um, and we actually directly compared Voltron uh, on the right here in red with the fluorescent protein-based sensor, ASM Neon Green, on the left here. And we were able to image these spiking signals that you see here for about 10 times longer with Voltron, up to around half an hour. So imaging for tens of minutes like this continuously was really critical for Glenn's project because they're studying memory formation, and it can take that long for the flies to finish the experiment. So that couldn't be done with the fluorescent protein-based indicator uh, because it would bleach, and then these signals are basically gone after just a couple of minutes. In zebrafish, uh, Misha Aaron's lab here at Genelia imaged Voltron with a, a light sheet microscope during a fictive swimming behavior that's depicted here in the top left. They image signals from around 10 excitatory neurons at a time from right in the middle of the fish's brain here. And here are the fluorescence traces from the uh, 11 neurons in this field of view. Um, and then on the right, I'm showing a zoom of the fluorescence traces for three of those neurons, uh, along with the, the behavior, the, the tail movements. So you can see that we can correlate these uh, fast action potential signals as well as the uh, subthreshold signals with these very fast tail oscillations that make up the swimming behavior. And this wasn't possible to do with calcium indicators that they'd been using previously uh, because of the much slower kinetics of the calcium. So Misha's lab uh, has used these data to make a model for the involvement of this particular brain region in the swimming behavior. Now finally with Carl Svoboda's lab and others, we've also imaged Voltron in mouse cortex and hippocampus. We've been able to image from dozens of neurons simultaneously, uh, as you can see in this field of view here. Uh, these are traces from 40 different neurons. And we can do that for more than 15 minutes continuously, which is significantly more neurons and longer duration than was previously possible. And that enables a more detailed analysis of the local circuit function on the time scale of voltage signals. So each of these biology labs that I've shown examples from is continuing to use Voltron for ongoing biology projects, which makes us confident these tools are needed by the neuroscience community. So we're going to continue to develop and optimize chemogenetic indicators like Voltron together with the Genie Team project. And I think Luke's going to mention some exciting new sensors that he and I have been developing together. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank the current and past members of my lab. Um, shown here on the left, as well as the really great collaborators that we have here at Genelia. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thanks, Eric, for that um, really fascinating talk. Um, not only was it great to hear about the tools that your lab um, has built and are currently building, but I think it also did a great job of highlighting um, sort of one of Genelia's um, key missions, is, uh, which is really to partner the tool builders and the tool users. Um, and so, you know, you highlighted that really uh, nicely in that work. So as the questions are starting to come in, I want to start with, um, uh, you had mentioned when you were talking about Campari, uh, mm -hmm. the possibility of correlating the signaling with um, transcriptional profiling of either individual neurons or sets of neurons. But can you tell us, can Campari or these other sensors um, be targeted to specific 
neurons or specific neuron types. Can you tell us, uh, is that possible? And, and maybe quickly sort of how that would work? Sure, absolutely. Um, so using specific drivers. Um, so for example, in, in the fruit fly, there's a great set of genetic reagents developed by Germans and others uh, that allow for expression of transgenes like GCAMP or, or Campari in um, specific neurons and, and um, these pieces of DNA that drive expression selectively in basically one neuron at a time in the fly's brain and you can pick which neuron you want. Um, so that's sort of the extreme case uh, for other model organisms used in neuroscience. Uh, there are sort of lesser versions of being able to do that. Um, but yeah, often in the case of neurons, because um, we want to be able to, Campari is often used just as a, as a first pass way to look at um, across the whole brain and shine the light. Um, it'll just highlight the subset of neurons that happen to be involved in that specific behavior. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, we have a question from Lou Sheffer. Lou, if you're there, would you like know, to ask your question? Oh, Eric, yeah. Biology can synthesize all sorts of uh, wild molecules. And so yeah. is there any chance of genetically encoding the genome of fluorophores? Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to steal Luke's thunder. They've definitely okay. played with uh, ideals like that. That would be fantastic, right? To be able to genetically encode all of these. Um, you know, I didn't talk about it too much, but um, in exchange for getting lots more photo photons out from the small molecule dyes, um, you have to, you know, the, the, the trade-off is that you have to be able to get these synthetic molecules into your sample. Um, whereas, you know, GFP and, and other genetically encodable, completely genetically encodable reagents, um, you know, you don't really have to do anything once, once, um, once the DNA is in the, in the cells. Um, in this case, we have to add the small molecule. So, yeah, it would be great to be able to genetically encode really great fluorophores, um, you know, a lot of work has been put into optimizing GFP and other fluorescent proteins, uh, and that, that work is ongoing. And, you know, I think there's hope that eventually they'll be as good as these small molecule fluorophores, um, and then maybe that won't require the addition of, of, uh, of the better fluorophores. Great, thanks. Um, there is another question um, from Jacek Kolonowski. Jacek, are you there? Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, cheers. Thanks a lot for, for this presentation. So I have a follow-up question actually on that one exactly. So how do you sure. deliver these fluorophores to the to the place where the protein is expressed? And then how deep you can actually observe into the tissue, you can observe these fluorophores with the most red-shifted ones? Sure, yes. Um, so yeah, I didn't touch on exactly how we get these uh, molecules into the sample. Um, it's different in the, in the different model organisms that we've sure. imaged. Um, so in the case of the, uh, of the flies, which I showed first, um, we can either put the dyes in the food and they eat it and it gets taken up and labels in the brain, um, or um, sometimes, you know, in the imaging that I showed, they're making um, sort of a window to be able to image in the brain by removing part of the cuticle. In that case, um, they can actually just add the dye to the solution that, they're, uh, that they have on between the microscope and the, and the fly's brain. Uh, and it diffuses into the brain and labels. Um, in the case of the mice, um, we intravenously inject it. So um, often, you know, the surgeries that uh, are required to be able to see into the brain um, also require intravenous injection of some uh, anesthetics or things like that. And so it's it's not really too much extra trouble to be able to have to inject this uh, a bolus of the dye. And then for the fish, it's actually super easy. You just put it in the water, they swim around for a little while, uh, and then you put them in some clean water to wash out the, the unbound dye. In mice, they don't localize in other places of the, of, of the, of the body? Like how, do, normally they would like be quite ubiquitously uh, spread, right, across the, across the body if you add it intravenously. Right, exactly. So um, the cool part here is that 
we have the, the dye, which, uh, like you say, once we inject it, is going to go everywhere in the body. Um, but then the dye is only going to stick uh, because we have this, this ligand. Um, the dye is only going to stick in cells where we have this halo tag protein component being expressed. Uh, and so as the circulation, uh, you know, washes the dye through the body and then washes it back out, uh, we end up only seeing the signal in the places where we've targeted the, the genetically targetable sensor. So, so is it a fluorogenic one then, uh, the, the dye? Uh, or um, we can do it with fluorogenic or non-fluorogenic dyes actually because um, we just wait a little while because the protein turnover once a molecule is labeled happens really slowly. Um, you know, you can see the dye up to a week later when it's bound to the halotag. Uh, we just wait, you know, maybe 24 hours for the unbound dye uh, to wash out of the mouse's system. Thanks, Eric. Um, we have another question um, from an audience member, DB. DB, are you there? Would you like to ask your question? How about I ask DB's question? Um, DB wants to know if, can, can these sensors be used to distinguish between presynaptic and postsynaptic um, inhibition? Um, sure, potentially. Uh, I, so GCAMP has been used for those types of experiments um, with calcium imaging. Um, for voltage imaging at the, the the imaging that we've done so far is sort of at the level of uh, an entire cell. Um, it's a little more challenging at the, again, at the speeds that are required for voltage imaging and the light intensities uh, to be able to do imaging at uh, individual synaptic direction, definitely. Cool. Thanks, Eric. I think at this point, mm -hmm. we will go ahead and um, move on to our second speaker.